be obedient. If it's less than you thought, likewise, be obedient to the Lord. Just give accordingly, please. trust you. You don't trust me? I mean, I want to trust you. I just don't. Well, I have a plan I think will really help. Oh, okay. But stand here, but face that direction. Okay. So, do you trust me? I just told you I don't. Well, this is all part of the exercise. Okay. When I say, do you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't? It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you. Okay, fall back. Are you going to catch me? <laughs> Don't worry about that part. Well, <laughs> that's the part I'm worried about. You can do this. Just trust me. Okay. Jesus, I trust you. Fall back. I'm just going to fall <laughs> back. Uh, 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 okay, okay. Let's, let's try this again. <sighs> Stand here, but keep your feet planted. Turn that direction. Okay. So do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you. Fall back. Oh my goodness, you caught me. I didn't think you were going to do it, but you did. That was great. Yes, that was great. You're ready for level two. Level two, here we go. Okay, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Wait, you're too close. You need to move way back. All right, this one's a little bit different. Stand here, but face me. Okay. Forward fall. I can do that. Wait. Wait for the signal. All right. The Jesus signal. Yes, the Jesus signal. Okay. So, do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you. Good. Fall back. <laughs> That's awesome. It is awesome, especially when you do it. Seriously? Of course. Jesus, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there is nobody back there. Well, I know it looks that way to you. It looks that way. It is that way. You can do this, Laura. Trust me and fall back. Jesus, I can't do it. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. Sometimes a preacher doesn't have to talk. Just get, give you a minute to stop singing it and 
do it. Thank you, uh, Revolution Band, for helping us to reset our heart. Yeah, you can give it up for them. They want no praise, but certainly we're appreciative of the work that they put in and their gifts and talents that they willfully share with us. So, thank you. Um, so, I'm excited to be back up here this week. Last week I was up here, but I... Uh, doing something a little bit different, as you know, if you were here, and you were all here last week, right? <laughs> Liars. And um, we're going to talk about that in a minute, all right? Um, but uh, we got to share a little bit about our trip to Chicago, which was tremendous. Um, we went up there. Uh, first and foremost, before I even talk about that, a little warm in here, right? A little warm in here. Air conditioning on this side was broken. Uh, we realized that at about 3.30, I called a buddy who does air conditioning, and this guy named Mike, he just came in here and saved the day, found the, the problem. The outside unit was like, the, the electric plant panel was melted. Like it must have caught fire. It was all black and melted. So nothing was working. Thing was running for two hours. It went down one degree. And it was roasting. Kind of like it is right now. But it's working. And, but it just it, it came on late. So pardon the, uh, the heat. And I've said this before, I say it again every time the air conditioning's broken, I think that that's God giving you an idea of what it's like if you don't repent and come to Him. <laughs> All right? Just a little experience, just a little foretaste of what could be. Let's just run from that, amen? Okay, so, so, um, so last week we shared a little bit about our experience in Chicago and how it relates to who we are. We're not Vertical Church, we're not Harvest Bible Chapel, we're Revolution Church. But some of the things that we learn there, we incorporate into who we are and what we do here. We are Revolution Church, and we have a, a, an identity statement. You see it up there on the screen, and, and it's this, and it's that we are a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. That's, who, uh, that's not who we are. Um, I think that there's power in our words, and I want to say this uh, correctly, that's who you are. Okay, that's who you are because God places people in the local body. He's the one who decides where you're going to church and he's the one who wants to use you to accomplish his purposes. So that's who you are if you're sitting in this room, okay? So this week I want to expand on one of the things that we talked about last week. It's my favorite thing to talk about and that's probably why it's the first week of doing this, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, some biblical preaching, but I want to expand on this, this, this identity statement first and expand on that a little bit. Um, this is who you are. This is what, what you do right there on the screen, okay? And, and, and it means this, that the reason why you're saved and the reason why you're here together is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Flat out, plain and simple, I, I'm just... Straight shooting, that's why you're here. It's the gospel that put us together here. That's the reason why we're here, okay? And, and, and because of the gospel bringing us together, everything that we do is a result of the gospel. And everything that we do in this church and out of the church is to advance the gospel. That's the reason why we exist. And, and so we, we're gospel-centered, that means we're here because of the gospel, and we exist to, to, to release the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, we go on in this statement where it says we're a culture-creating community. Now, this, this piggybacks on the fact that you've been brought together here because of the gospel into a community of faith. So you're here. This is, not, this is not talking about outside. See, everyone talks about what we should do out there, and that's awesome. But this is not the outside stuff. This is why you've been brought here is to be a culture-creating community. So you come here, and you learn a different way to live than everyone else is living. Remember the scriptures say that we're not supposed to copy the behaviors and customs of this world. 
So we're supposed to be conformed into the image of Christ and then help others to be conformed into the image of Christ. We are not to be conformed into the image of the world. And so we come here into this place to learn a new way to live. That's why you're here. So it's a gospel-centered, culture-creating community, and then we bring beauty to the world. See, what happens in here should affect what you do out there. So you come in here, you learn a different truth. You learn a different way. You learn new perspectives and purpose, and then you leave, and you carry that with you wherever you go. So you come here to learn and grow, and then you're released into the world to bring that beauty to the ends of the earth. So I would just venture to say, I would throw this out there for your consideration, that this church is inwardly focused with an outward goal. You see, most churches, there's this false dichotomy. You're either inward and you don't care about anybody, or you're totally evangelistic, but everyone gets neglected here. We are inwardly focused with an outward goal. Do you understand? Our job here is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, and if we will make disciples of Christ, they will, say will, they will evangelize the world. Does that make any sense at all? The Bible doesn't say to go make evangelists. What does it say? It says to go make disciples, and disciples will evangelize. Amen? Okay. Now, there's several ways that we can do that here in the church. There's several ways that we can disciple people. And there's this ongoing discussion within the church of Jesus Christ. How do you make disciples? What what do you do? Do you you meet with someone one-on-one each week, get coffee, open up the Bible? That's one way. Do you grab, a, if you're a, an older woman, do you grab a younger woman and just have her ride with you in the car and, and, and go to your house and see how you do it and see how you serve your husband and your children and you just show by example? That's another way, right? There's a lot of different ways. But there's one way, there's one way that's the main way. Um. Jonathan Edwards, one of the most powerful preachers to ever walk the face of this earth, said this, God has appointed a particular and lively application of his word in the preaching of it as a fit means to affect sinners with the importance of religion, their own misery, the necessity of a remedy, and the glory and sufficiency of a remedy provided, and to stir the minds of the saints and to quicken their affections. And that's what I want to speak to you about tonight. To be a vertical church, a church that's centered here, biblical preaching is the number one way that we make disciples of Christ. Biblical preaching. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about that. What is the preacher, the preacher in Scripture, right? Because that's all that matters. You don't care about what I think, right? Tell me you don't. I don't care what you think, Moses. The biblical preacher is is Kairuso. Caruso is a herald. It's a herald. It's a herald who public, publicly proclaims the message of another. Heralds are stupid. They can't come up with anything on their own. It's not thus saith Moses. It's not thus saith Tyler. It's not thus saith Lori. It's thus saith the king. And he has a message, Right? And his message is not my message. He gave us a message, right? It's right here. Hold up your Bible. Hold up your Bible. Hold up your Bible, right? This is the message that God gave you. This is what, yeah, baby, you know it. This is the message, right? Not my message or your message. It's his message. It's God's word. That's his message. He, the, 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 the preacher is the town crier, right? Thus saith the king. What happens if, if, if the herald stands on the corner of the city? Thus saith the king. He said you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And, and the king said that you should, you should do this and, and you should do that. 
You know, the town crier, the herald, implies public and volume. That's why I'm always yelling at you. <laughs> volume. He's a herald, right? When you want to get a message out, you're loud, right? You get big, obnoxious billboards, and you scream at the top of your lungs, thus saith the king. That's how you get people's attention, right? Volume. Right? I love Jonathan Edwards. He said, the lively preaching. One of the greatest travesties in all the world is, listen, I've, I've been to a bunch of churches now. You have too. You go up there, that guy is as bored, right? He, he is so bored. And, 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 and how are you going to get excited if the guy up here is not excited? Right? Right? So because a preacher is a herald. And, he's, and it's lively, and he's excited, and, and God has taken him to the floor. And, and you're a sinner, and you saved me, and I was wretched, and I can't believe it. And wow, awesome news, right? You don't go up to your, you know, when you started dating, did you go up to your buddies and go, hey, you know, I, I got this new girl that I'm kind of dating. No. Like when you fall in love, with someone that you don't deserve to have, like me, you, no, not that I'm awesome, that my wife is awesome. Yeah, Clarify that. We, that's one of the things about preaching, clarity. So clear, so you understand, right? Good preaching is clear preaching, and, and clarity is I don't deserve my wife. She is beautiful. She has face like, like I've never seen in my life. I'm freaking out. She's totally cool. She spent one day in Tallahassee just now, taking Bailey to her apartment. I had two kids for one day. I wanted to jump off a bridge. <laughs> She's awesome, Wonder Woman. <clears throat> but when you find someone like that, you won't believe this girl, right? You don't, you're not quiet about it. You're, you're, you're freaking out about it because you can't believe it. And so if Jesus Christ fixes the unfixable and you got nothing to do you can't fix yourself and he reaches down from heaven the bible says that jesus is the creator that he's the one who spoke everything was created by him and for him and he's the one who reaches down from heaven and rips you out of the sewer of hell like that's not something to celebrate if that won't raise your voice listen if you're a preacher go wait on tables you need to give it up because no one wants to listen to that you put me to sleep and i'm leaving and so you should be excited, volume, public. So, so I want to kind of go over a couple things about uh, biblical preaching. I want to go over the what, why, and how of, of uh, biblical preaching. Be here's the reason I want to do that is because I believe, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, so it's not the scriptures, this is just my opinion now, but I believe that there's always been a bit of a chasm between leaders in the church who are kind of on fire for the Lord, serving the Lord frantically all the time, super zealous about it, and then there's the rest of the people. And, and, and I think that there's some people in the seats at churches that, 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 that really, the, the, the pilot's burning, it's there, but that well, we need to fan the flame of faith and get you and reduce this chasm that's between here and there and bring you all into the fray of ministry and get you fired up. You ever see one of their boats? Where everyone's, this is a slave boat, it's not a pretty boat, but they're all rowing at the same time. Right? And when they're rowing at the same time in unison, they're getting somewhere. But when we're not all rowing, the boat's heavy, and we don't get anywhere, and then we start complaining about our church isn't effective, it's not reaching, it's not all it could be, it's because you're not rowing. And I want to call you into the rowing of the boat so we're all in this together. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So you think I'm, let me ask you a question, do you think I'm a raging loon for Jesus? Do you? Do you? Okay, I want all of you to be raging loons. What would happen if we were all raging loons for Jesus? That would be awesome. And the city would hear it. Right? They might not hear my voice, but they'll hear a hundred of you yelling. Okay, so that's what we're supposed to do. So what will the man of God preach? What will he herald from the podium? Uh, sociology, psychological, mumbo-jumbo, Dr. Phil, get better relationship, junk? No. No. What he'll preach is the word of God. A, a, a preacher is to preach another one's message. 
it's, it's not his opinion on how we can get along better or how to parent better or how to do better finances and stuff based on psychological studies and stuff like that. Save that for a class on Tuesday. We're talking the, the pulpit right now, right? So, so, so what will he preach? He'll preach the word of God. So I can't tell you that unless I, what? Open the word of God. You guys paying attention? Okay, open up a Bible. That's what we do. Open up a Bible. Don't make excuses. Open up your Bible. This is going to be a tough, I'm, I'm coming after you tonight, so just, just, just bear with me because I think that churches need to have straightforward, blatant dialogue on truth. We don't need to hide things. We don't need to come beat around the bush or sugarcoat nothing. This is the truth. Open your Bible. Put your eyes on God's word. If you want to be convinced of truth, it's not going to happen just coming out of my mouth. You need to see it written. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Go there. If you have one of the Bibles here that we provide for you, you see the page number up on the screen. You won't find this in the text of Scripture. You'll, this is just me again. I'm just stepping away from the Bible. We don't put the verses on the screen because I think part of biblical preaching is your involvement of putting your eyes on God's Word. And, and if, if a preacher is going to be effective, which I want to be, I, I'm like anyone else, I have a job to do, and I want to be effective, and one of the ways I could be effective is if I can help train you to read your scriptures at home, then you'll be much better off, and you'll be more effective, and, and you'll be better prepared to be used by the Lord, and so we, we train you here by having you open the Bible here, because if you open it here and get familiar with it, you won't be so scared to do it at home. Amen? So, page 723 in these pew Bibles, but uh, for those of you that have your own device or Bible, please uh, make sure you're paying attention now. Don't be messing around on Instagram or nothing, okay? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is the Apostle Paul, and, and he says to Timothy, his protege, this is the guy who he, he appointed to be the pastor of the church in Ephesus, Famous church. One of the Bible books is called Ephesians. It's written to them. The, the, it's in Revelation as well. Famous church, famous guy. Paul's looking at Timothy. He says this. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. So he's probably like, listen up, right? God's right here. And he, and he wants me to say some things to you, Timothy. You need to pay attention, right? So he's saying that to you. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Now stop for a second. Look at me for a second. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at me. There's a lot of things he could have said there, right? Like one day Jesus is coming. And, and so you got this church and you got to get ready. So, so, so I, I don't know if there was, if there was, if there was, uh, if there was uh, someone famous coming to, to this church. You know, they do it in Hollywood or something. They put out the red carpet, right? Jesus is coming. Let's put out the red carpet. Jesus, listen, do you ever work retail and, and all of a sudden the district manager says they're coming? What do you guys do? You clean the store like you've never, right? Clean it like crazy, right? Because you want him to think that that's the way it always is. Like when the people come to your house, you know what I'm saying, come on. Right, yeah, right. So that's, there's a lot of things that he could have told him what to do because Jesus is, is going to come get this church ready. What, what does he tell him to do? He says, in the, preach the word. Preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Where's the soft serve there? Nowhere. Where's the seeker-friendly, don't offend there? He says, Timothy, rebuke your people. Tell them where they're wrong, right? And encourage them. Like, if you have any extra time at the end of the sermon. No, I'm, no, I'm just making that up. Look, why? Why would he do this? Of all the things he could have told him to do, he says, preach the word because there's a time that's coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. And because of this, Timothy, preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. He's in Ephesus. Ephesus was an idea. 
idolatry center of, of sin and sewer. It was the place where they had this massive temple that was dedicated to the goddess Artemis. Lots of sexual immorality. It was disgusting, sorcery, awful place. And that's where Timothy planted the church with Paul, right? That's where he's doing ministry. See, we think we have it hard here because they might take away our tax-exempt status. Like, it's not popular to do what Paul's telling him to do in this city. Like, that was a city that didn't want Christians. And Christianity's now invading this city. It's a tough place to preach. But what does he tell him to do? He says, to be prepared. So this is biblical preaching. I'm talking about bi biblical preaching. So he says, Timothy, study up. Study up. Do you know that it takes me approximately every week, at least 15 hours in that book to do what I'm doing here with you. And that's not to praise me, I'm nothing. But that's what he's talking about. Don't just get up and tell people what you think or some story about what happened with your dog. It doesn't matter. What matters is be prepared to study, to show yourself approved, to rightly divide the word of truth so you can preach it to the people. Be prepared, study. That's a biblical preacher, studies. Then he says, whether the time is favorable or not. So in that city, it was not favorable to preach the gospel. In that city, it's not favorable to share God's word. And in our city, it's becoming increasingly less favorable to preach the Bible, isn't it? Yeah. But what does Paul say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Be bold. You preach that word no matter what people say, no matter what people think. If they want to go to a church where their ears will be tickled, let them go. There's two doors, and they, they go that way. But in this church, I want you to preach, he said. Preach the word. And I take that to me, too. Preach the word of God. We're going to preach the word of God. That's what we're going to do. Listen, even in preaching about preaching, we're preaching the word of God. That's what we do. It's the only thing that's going to work. We preach the word of God. And then he says, to correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. To me, that just screams, be clear. See, see the reason he's saying correct, rebuke, and encourage with good teaching, he's like, I, I, there's something I want said to my people because there's something I want to happen in them. And so the only way for that to happen is if you're clear with what you say. And he says, be bold, correct them, rebuke them. So feelings are not priority from the biblical preacher. My, your feelings are not my priority. God has something to say to you, and he wants me to say it with clarity so that that thing can happen. And if you walk out of here offended and hurt, praise God. God, I hope it's not because I was just mean to you, but because you are convicted by the word of God. And that's okay. You walk out of here crying, praise God. It's okay. It's okay. He said, be clear. I have something I want said. So don't sugarcoat it. Don't beat around the bush. Don't be politically correct. Just preach the word with clarity so they can understand. So what I want to happen in their life will. That's it. We want to be effective. That's it. That's what we're looking for here. So what do we preach? We preach the word of God. And um, why? Why do we preach the word of God? Well, obviously it says to preach it. So just raw obedience, of course. Why is it dark in here? Are those all the way up? Really? Am I just going blind? It's dark. Oh, I know what? Yes, that's because these aren't on. I can't see that there's some light. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. My feelings mean nothing. See, sermon illustration. Okay, so we, we preach the word of God, yes, out of raw obedience, but also because it works. See, God has something to say to you, and he wants something to happen in you, and the only way for that to happen in you is if you preach the word of God. 
psychological Dr. Phil stuff isn't going to change you in the heart. It might change your, uh, your actions. It might change your behavior. But if it starts here, it won't get to here. And God is after the heart. He's going right after your heart. That's what the Word of God does. And so that's why we preach the Word of God. Because, listen, I only get you for one hour a week. And so if I'm going to be effective and I would love to see change and I'm not hiding that, that I would love to see you all conformed into the image of Christ, not nearly as much as God wants to. So if I only have an hour, what would I spend my hour doing other than using the most effective words possible? And that's the word of God. Understand? So uh, let's look why we would read the word of God. Well, um, famous verse around here. I'm going to read it again, never get tired of it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The reason why, yes, obedience, because he says preach the word, but it works. Why? All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And listen, so why do we use it? Why do we do this? It goes on to say that God uses that to prepare you to do every good work. So if there's something that he wants done in this church, it's not for me to, to start an evangelism class and teach you how to go down the Romans road and give you strength and courage to knock on a door. Preach the word of God and you'll be inspired to go knock on a door. That's what he's saying. The way to get anything done in the people so that the church can be effective in, 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 in accomplishing the mission that has been set upon it is by preaching the word of God. You preach the word of God, they will go. If you preach the word of God, they will plant churches. If you preach the word of God, they will love people. If you preach the word of God, they will be compassionate. If you preach the word of God, everything that he wants you to do will be done. And that's why we're to preach the word of God. It's, it's, it's been inspired by God to teach us to be like God. And when that word gets in, it doesn't return void. It always accomplishes the task that it's been set out to accomplish. And that's why we preach the word of God. Why else? Well, do me a favor. There's got to be some benefit um, to you. We see the benefit for the Lord and his kingdom. We preach the word of God and all the things he wants done will happen, right? But what about the benefit to you? Look at Psalm 19. Go back to the Old Testament. Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 are very um, concentrated sections of Scripture that actually talk about Scripture. So this is God's Word about God's Word. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. I'm not going to take you through that one tonight. That would be forever. But Psalm 19 is kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like the cheat sheet of Psalm 119, right? So in Psalm 19, uh, starting in, well, over in verse 7, look at verse 7. Are you guys there? You there? Okay. Almost, I heard. You there now? Okay. Okay. Here we go. The instructions of the Lord are perfect reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. So you can see there's actually four things there. The, this, the instructions, the decrees, the commandments, the commands, these are all the same word. These are all found in God's word, all of these things. The word of God is all of these things for you. And so the first one, I, I, the reason why we would preach God's word is because it works. But, but look at the first one. It says that it revives the soul. Now, I'm going to be honest here in church for a moment. How many people have ever walked into church and, and, and you felt like you were at your end? Like you, preacher, you got to give me something that it just gets me, th listen, I might not get saved tonight, but I want to just live tonight. Like, I need something that's going to just get me to wake up tomorrow. Have you ever been there? 
right? You, you just need, right? And then all of a sudden, right? I don't know how it happens, because I'm telling you, there ain't nothing special about me. But all of a sudden, the word goes out, right? He's preaching the word of God. And all of a sudden, each one of those people, they get it. They get the thing that they needed, right? And all of a sudden, you go from complete despair to, man, there's, there's hope, right? You ever been there? Have you guys been there? Listen, this is a big moment right here. Have you been the end of your rope and all of a sudden he says something in the Bible and all of a sudden you feel like you have hope again because the word of God is true that the word of God revives the soul. And you're a, you're a desert when you walk in and you feel like you're in one foot in the grave and the preacher says something from the Bible and all of a sudden it pierces your heart and you know you can go one more day. That's what he's talking about. That's why we preach the word of God, because it revives the soul. It says also that the word uh, makes wise the simple. Um, how many people in here are, are uh, engineers of infrared thermology and, and um, biochemists and neurosurgeons. Yeah, doctor. Yeah, none of you, right? None of me. I'm not. None of me. I can't even speak. None of us, right? We're all a bunch of everyday Joes, right? How many in here people are just like amazingly gifted intellect? None, right? We're just regular people, right? So isn't it amazing how God's word would make wise the simple? That somehow... You'd, you'd learn a bunch of amazing stuff that didn't put you in debt for 150 grand for a student loan. That you, that you could just open up this book right here and the creator of the universe would, would, would unveil to you some truth so you'd have some knowledge about some stuff. That's awesome, right? And it's free. You don't have to pay. You don't have to enroll. You don't have to get financial aid. You don't need grants. Nothing. It takes the regular people. Listen, I barely graduated high school and you're all sitting in here listening to me. What's wrong with you people? And, and it's, so there's the proof. Like, I barely graduated high school. Like, I, I, you know how many times I failed math? Amen. Hey, you go to high school for four years. Well, most of us do, right? I failed math three of the years. Do you know I still don't know my multiplication tables? Thank you for not laughing, so you're an encouraging church. That's good. Do you know how many times I failed Spanish? I took it twice. Take a guess on how many times I failed it. Dos. I just, I just got that one just now. That was good, right? I'm a bust. I'm not smart at all. But somehow, some way, God, with, with his word, has somehow imparted onto this dodo some knowledge and some wisdom. And that's awesome. And it's the same for you. Nobody in here is super amazing intellect back on, uh, what is it, uh, summa cum laude of their class. Just regular people. But somehow, he imparts wisdom to us through his word. It also says that it brings joy to the heart, right? God's word brings joy to the heart. You know, we have some really cute kids back there, right? Do you see Danielle's little baby? Right? She's three months old today, adorable little baby, right? So listen, I could take a picture of her and I could put it up there on the screen and you'd go, oh, that's cute little baby and she's so sweet and cute, and she is. Let me tell you something, in 13 years you add pimples and an attitude and it's not gonna be so pretty anymore, <laughs> right? It's true, right? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Don't laugh. It was, it, that was us, too. We were cute one day, and this happened. <laughs> because things change. Everything changes. But you know what doesn't change? Heaven and earth will melt away, but the word of the Lord l l lasts forever. And the word of the Lord says, like here, how about this one in John 1, 12, that because of Jesus, you're a child of God. Yeah. Right? The baby picture makes you happy for a minute. But then it fades. But that right there, no matter when you open it, no matter when you hear it in church, it, it, something happens. I said it, you guys started clapping. That's lasting happy. That's called joy. 
So, so how about this? How about Galatians 4, 7? Okay, since you're not a slave but a child, you're also a co-heir of God's glory. That's awesome too, right? How, how about John 14, 2 and 3? Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when everything's right, I'll come back and I'll get you so you can be with me forever. That's joy, right? That's joy. That's, that comes from the word of God, the, the never-changing truths of who God is and who you are in him. And every time the preacher says these things, it's not to get you saved. It's to stir up your faith again in a fresh way, to get excited about who you are in him. That's joy. And then it says that it gives you insight for a living. That's kind of cool, right? Like advice? Like not advice from me. Like, <laughs> like, I didn't graduate, I barely graduated, right? I, I can't do my multiplication table, so don't ask me to help you with your budget at your house. <laughs> you see? Don't ask me to tutor your kid in Spanish. <clears throat> but somehow, some way, God gives you advice. Do you know that God's word doesn't speak of every single particular situation you could possibly be in. But there are overriding principles found in God's word that will answer every single question you would have about your children, about your spouse, about your home, about your career, about where to live, about your finances, about every single thing. And you just need to crack open the word of God and it will, it will give you insight for living yeah. all the time. So what do we preach? We preach the word of God. Why do we preach it? Um, because it's God's word and it works. And I'll just say these four things in a nutshell. It's helpful, right? It's helpful. It's helpful. It's helpful to you. So we've got the, uh, we've got the what and the why. Let's talk about the how. Like, <clears throat> so here you are again. Why this? Why, 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 why this format? Why are we in this room set up the way it is? Why am I preaching like this? And I'm talking about like the actual process now of doing what I'm doing right now and you're sitting there listening. Like wh why do we do that? Have you ever thought about that? <clears throat> I love you. And, and, and because I love you, I will just say this, that informed worship or informed worshipers are better worshipers. And, and informed worshipers are better than just everybody's doing it, I told you this is the way it works, follow the cattle kind of worship, which is what most people are probably even doing in this room right now. And I would tell you that I did that too till I discovered what I'm going to share with you. Informed worshipers are better worshipers. You should know why you're sitting in this room doing this right now as I'm doing this right now. Informed worshipers are better worshipers. So I'm going to read to you something and you're not going to be able to read it because um, I think it's a weak weak translation in the New Living Translation that we use here most of the time. And so I'm going to read something from Nehemiah chapter 8 from the New American Standard, which is a much better translation when it comes to this section of Scripture. And we're going to see what the how looks like. And I want you to do me a favor, since you can't follow it in the Bible anyway, I need you to stand, please. And you will understand why you're standing as I read. Please stand. Awesome. Nehemiah chapter 8 will explain to us exactly why we're doing what we do each and every week here at Revolution Church. This is what it says. And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read, it from, he read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. 
Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood 13 people. Names are complicated. Doesn't matter. (laughs) They were at his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra, after he finished, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, exclamation mark, while lifting up their hands, and then bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, 13 more people at his right, names don't matter, they explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. You may sit. Okay, I'm unashamedly um, going to bring to you 13 points from that. 13 I don't know how long I've been standing up here so far. Don't know, don't care. 13 points. And if you have a notebook, I I would seriously encourage you to write these things down. This is the how of biblical preaching. What you're going to find out though here, this is kind of weird. That even though he's talking about gathering to preach God's word, you're going to see very little in here about the preacher. The reason why it's very crucial that I read this to you so that you can be informed is because most of what I read was about you. See, biblical preaching doesn't just include the guy who studied to show himself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, and then stepping forth and boldly preaching the word. It involves all of us. You see, I'm trying to shrink the chasm. We're part, you, listen, it doesn't matter if I am so ready and I studied for 100 hours. If you're not here... What's the sense? And so you're here, and there's a reason you're here, and there's something you need to do so that we could be effective in preaching the Word of God. So 13 things, write them down. Here's the first one. All the people. And all the people gathered. All the people gathered. Uh, Luke 14, we learned this a couple weeks ago as I preached it to you, where it says that we're to urge all to come and fill his house. Everyone. Everyone. We're to, we're to urge them to come and fill the house. Hebrews 10, 25, do not neglect the assembling. Do not neglect the meeting. Do not neglect the gathering, depending on your translation. Listen, as some are in the habit of doing. And so I ask you tonight, are you in the habit? Are you in the habit of blowing off the meeting? See, some people, pay attention up here, some people are in the habit of blowing off this gathering. And what I mean by that is that's your default. That you'll come if there's nothing else happening. Nothing else better than this. You'll come. And some people, listen, it's not, this is not to offend or hurt your feelings. God's word, it, God notices this. That there are some that are in a habit of blowing it off. That's, that not everybody has got gathering here on Saturday night or Sunday morning in pen in blood, (laughs) Jesus' blood, on your calendar. There are some that don't. But biblical preaching, if it's to be effective to accomplish that thing that God wants to accomplish, you need to be here. Can I tell you how many times I've stood at this pulpit and preached a message, and when the night was done and I'm driving home with my wife, man, I wish so-and-so was here. That was for them. I wish so-and-so was here because that was for them. But it just seems like the ones who need to be here to hear it, they make a habit of not being here. Now, Some of the people that aren't here tonight, it's because they make a habit of not being here. And maybe you're like that person too. Maybe you make it a habit of not being here, but you chose to be here tonight. So let this word be for you tonight. Don't be a person that makes it a habit of neglecting the gathering. Amen? Please. If we're going to be effective, you have to be here to receive the word so he can actually do something in you. All right? Empty pews do not help. Okay, the next thing it says here, it says all the people gathered 
as one man. What does that mean, as one man? Um, how about nobody is higher or better? Nobody is special or, or outside of the authority of God's word. We're all on equal ground, right? God's word is here, and all the rest of us are down over here. And, and what that means is that it doesn't matter if you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and you're bringing home, you know, $100 million a year or you're, you're flipping burgers at McDonald's. It doesn't make any difference. When we gather in God's house to hear God's word, we're on level playing field. All of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we've accomplished in our life, we are nothing special. We are here. God is here. We sit under the authority of God's word. Okay? That's what that means. As one man. Like you can't distinguish between us because we're all the same here. We were sinners, saved by grace. Now we're all saints if we've embraced Christ by faith and we're on level playing field. No one's special. I don't care if you're the pastor. I don't care if you're an elder. I don't care if you're the worship leader. It doesn't make any difference. If Billy Graham walked in here, he's no different than the rest of you. Everyone's the same. As one man, we sit under the authority of God's word. Now look, here's the third thing. It says that they asked the people, all the people, asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law. So the third thing is this. They wanted God's word. See, part of biblical preaching is that you have to have willing heart and teachable hearts right here. You have to be willing and teachable. You, you don't, listen, you don't want soft serve. You don't want your ears tickled. You want the truth. Tell me the truth, preacher. That's what you want. Listen, and that's what we're going to do here. And, and so every week, I'm, I'm, by God's grace, I'm coming after you with the truth. Because that's what godly people want. They want to know the truth so that, because the truth sets them free. And they don't want to hear any ideas or, or your opinions or philosophies. They mean nothing. What's the word of God say? Preacher, what am I supposed to do with my life? I don't know. Open it, read it, and do it. That's what it says. That's what you do. That's all people need to hear. The rest of it is just flapping your gums, wasting people's time. I don't know about you, I have zero, zero time for small talk. Amen. I don't have time for small talk, right? Who's, been, who, who's got so much time on their schedule that we can sit around and talk about daisies and bunnies? I have no time for that. Uh, you guys, some of you are looking at your watch right now. You don't want to even hear what I'm saying right now. Give me the truth, preacher. Don't talk about bunnies. You're talking about bunnies, preacher. Stop talking about bunnies. <laughs> Get to the word. So it says that they, they actually asked, the, they said, preacher, please bring the word of God. We don't want to hear other stuff. We want to hear the Bible. That's what we want. See, that's not me, is it? My job is to bring it, but your job is what? To want it. You have to want it. If you don't want it, I could, look, I could get up here and I could preach a home run. It won't matter. It won't matter. I could preach the best message that ever was preached. It won't matter. If your heart is not receptive, you don't come in here prayed up and ready to receive, saying, listen, I'm as one man. I am nothing. You are everything. I want your word, and whatever you say, I'm going to do it. Because I trust that if I do it, the best thing's going to come of it. That's it. That's the, that's the attitude you have to have. That's the only place biblical preaching thrives, is in a garden that's receptive. Okay, here, here's, the, here's the next thing. It's, I love, this is my favorite part. He read, it from, he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate. You ready? From early morning until midday. What time was that? It doesn't say. We could, maybe, right? I don't know. What's early morning? Six, five, seven, five, right? It doesn't say, right? It doesn't say. Isn't that beautiful? It doesn't say. If he wanted it to, us to know, it would have said it, right? It, he doesn't want us to know. He just wants us to know that the time doesn't matter. That the, 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 the discussion of your sermons are too loud, take it to another church, yo, I don't care. This, the Bible says those people wanted it, and he, and, he, and he got up and he preached from 7 in the morning till, till, till noon. Midday is noon, right? 
So, so, so when I start preaching for, I, I pre, listen, I preached at our old building for two hours and 21 minutes one time, and people were going to have my head. I'm thinking, man, we're just getting warmed up. Yes. What else are you going to get? You go elsewhere. Are you going to get something that's more beneficial when you go to Golden Corral? Are you going to get a, a better, are you going to get something that's going to revive your soul at the movie theater? So why, you, why would anyone complain? They, I want the word of God. Tell, tell me the truth. I'm lost. I need it. Tell me. right? So he, it says that he, he preached from early morning until midday. No, no specific time, so we don't want to be legalistic and say, you know, sermons should be 47 minutes because that's attention span. Who gives a rip? That's not, listen, if I was talking to you about finances, then maybe it would be 45 minutes, but I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm preaching supernatural words. So, we, so all the secular uh, 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 statistics of, of attention span are out the window because we're not talking about secular topics. We're talking about the supernatural word of God that has power to change a life. So it shouldn't matter how long it takes, right? I'm going to preach all night. That's it. I'll, uh, listen, I'll come up with some stuff. I don't know. I got some preachers here. Come on, Jay. You got some old stuff you got in your back pocket, don't you? You ready? All right, so let's go on to the next one here, right? Uh, so not only did they want it, and they were all there, and they were humble, and it was long, but it says, and all the people were attentive. See, see that? And I didn't do it this week, but that's why, I, that's why most of the time I get in here and, I, and before I preach, I always say, hey, hold up, hold up a second. Does God have your full attention? Put your phone away. Get off Instagram, unless you're on an app. It's fine. You can choose to use your little fake Bible all you want. I don't care. <laughs> Just kidding. You come in with scrolls next week. Oh, is this what you meant? <laughs> no, they're cool. It's all good. Um, but that's why I say it, because biblical preaching is worthless. I, like I said, it could hit a home run in here, give you the best that, that God would give. But if, if you're not paying attention, listen, I've sat here, I've been preaching in this church, I've been preaching for a while, but at, for, in this church, it's over seven years now. And, and I can't tell you how over the years I have watched people that I know and love and they sit weak after week after week and they're sitting there with their arms crossed and their hand on their head in their hand and they're dozing off and they're on Facebook and I'm like, why are you even here? Go watch football. Listen. Biblical preaching is only effective. God wants something said, and he wants something done. And if you're not paying attention, I hit a home run, it doesn't matter. Biblical preaching requires your attention. That's why I always ask you if you're paying attention. That's why I always suggest you bring a notebook and bring a pen, because you're, that means you're attentive. You're jotting some things down. I want to know what this means, God. I'm, I'm going to meditate on it this week. I'm going to study what it means so I can learn, so I can grow, so the thing you want to accomplish in my life actually will come to pass. That's why we're supposed to pay attention. That's why sometimes, and I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but sometimes I'll say, hey, no, 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 look it up here. You know, a little baby walks by, you want to look, that, 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 look at that baby, it's not going to help you none. Be quoting a verse, that's going to help you. Amen. You see, we've got to pay attention. And, and I'm not saying that because I'm making anything up. The Bible, biblical preaching says all the people were attentive. It's not in there because it sounds good. It's in there because you're supposed to be attentive. I got to say, tonight I'm watching and, and faces are definitely attentive. Like I'm, you do that when you're up here doing this. You're watching people. You're seeing if they're engaging. People generally in this room right now are very, very engaged. And I think that's awesome. I think that and I believe that because God's word's being preached and you're being attentive, that, that I think you're changing right here, right now. I do. I think that God's changing you right now, that, that you're different than when you got here. Um, how about here, here's the next one. Um, and I think uh, I combined six and seven. It says that Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium. So sue me. Right? I mean, 
<laughs> right? He's at a podium. Um, jump down to verse 5, and it says, and he was standing above all the people when he opened it. Why this? Why this? Is, it, is there a reason? Or is it just because that's the way it's always been done? So that's what we do. Informed worshipers are better worshipers. Listen, I would suggest to you that the position of the preacher reflects the importance of the person whose message he's bringing. Centrally located. Listen, you know that, 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 that Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6 that when he saw the Lord in the temple, he was high and lifted up. And if I'm supposed to be bringing your, his message to you, then it's not me that's high and lifted up, but his message is high and lifted up. And so on the stage, centrally located, your eyes are on it, your ears are open, because this message is his message. So the position of the, of the preacher, it, it represents the importance of the person whose message it is. High and lifted up. Centrally located. The focal point. Not the person, but the message. Amen? Okay. Um, here's the next one. We did it tonight. When he opened the book of the law, they all stood. Why didn't they stand when Ezra got to the platform? He doesn't mean anything. Do you know what the Bible calls you? If you're obedient to Christ and you're in ministry and you're performing what task he's ordained for you to, to, to perform, do you know what he says of you? You're an unworthy servant doing your duty. That's in Luke. I'm not making this up. You can look it up. An unworthy servant doing his duty. That's Ezra. I'm an unworthy servant doing my duty. I'm not worthy of the gospel. He gave it to me. It was a free gift of his grace. I didn't earn it. I didn't want it. I didn't try to get it. He gave it to me. So the only reason why I'm up here doing this is because of his grace. I'm an unworthy servant doing my duty. And so that's why when I come to the stage, you better not stand up. And when, 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 when Ezra got to the stage, you don't stand up. But when someone important comes into the room like a judge, what do you do? Right. When the bride comes into the room, what do you do? And so when the preacher gets up to preach the message you better stand up because that's God entering the room. Do you see? And that's why they stood, because there was reverence in awe of the Lord. The messenger means nothing. The message is everything. And that's why they stood. Because they were, they were acknowledging the one whose words it really was. These are God's words. And his message to his people. And the preacher is only the mouthpiece of the, of the Holy One who has given him the words to say. And out of the mouth of the preacher comes the words of God. And so when his words come into the room, we stand in reverence and awe of God. That's what they did. There was reverence for the Lord. But in churches now, there's, you come in and there's, there's feet up on the pews feet up on the tables, they're slouching over, their head is in their hand. You wouldn't do that in the courtroom when the judge walked in, right? You wouldn't do that when the bride walks into the room and the music starts playing. Would you be sitting there with your feet up on top of the table? Of course not. And I think that we need to have a comfortable place where you can feel loved and warm and at home, but don't you Dare put your feet up on these seats when the man, whoever it is, myself or anyone else, is preaching this message, feet off the pews, yo. Because that's God's message and we have reverence and we honor the Lord in the way we conduct ourselves. There's reverence. Well, let's move on. Uh, I'm on number nine, so we're almost there. <clears throat> number nine is this says, then Ezra blessed the Lord. So when he gets done, and I don't know what his closing was, right? I don't know. When he gets done with his, his sermon, he closes. He says something like, you know, and, and we love you, Lord, and we bless you, Lord, and, 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 we, and, and we obey you, Lord, in Jesus' name, and, and right? I mean, he, did, he said something. He blessed the Lord. And then what happens? The people answered, amen, amen. Now listen, I, I want you to be a student of God's word, Okay? Informed worshipers are better worshipers, right? There's an exclamation mark after the amens. What does that imply? Woo! 
Amen. Amen. Right? They're excited. They're excited. And so the ninth thing that I want to glean from this text is that the people should be responsive and vocal and excited about what they're hearing. That should, should, there should be fresh faith stirring in the heart of the believer when they're here listening to God's word. And so that's why like this a little bit ago, Jessica was saying this ain't your mom's church or something. Listen, I don't know what church you were brought up in. The church that told you that if you yelled something out and you were excited that you got a backhand from your mom, this is, that's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. There's no reason why it's in here other than it's prescriptive for you. When you hear God's word, given to you, proclaimed over you. You get excited. If, you're, if your spirit's excited, like, let it out. He said he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth, right? Spirit, get excited. Amen. Awesome word, man. Woo, yeah. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what, that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be excited about his word. And when he stirs up excitement inside of you, listen, don't suppress it. You're robbing yourself you're robbing yourself and you're robbing the Lord the glory that he deserves. Don't suppress your excitement anymore. Man, people should walk into this church and they should experience a group of people that are so excited about why they, co they came here. Carry your smile with you. Carry your excitement with you. Let them know that there's something awesome about being a Christian, that there's something awesome about coming to Revolution Church. Don't just sit there like you're in a library. Get excited if you're excited. Let it out. God gave you emotions, and he gave you a voice, and he gave you hands, and he gave you to clap and yell and scream and woo. Do it. Don't save it for the Packers. Do it. Here's the next one. Number 10. They screamed, amen, amen, while lifting up their hands. While lifting up their hands. 1 Timothy 2a, this has been a discussion in our church often. Do we have to do this? Do we have to do this? And if it gets to that place of do we have to do this, then just don't. Just don't. Let's change your verbiage a little bit. We get to do this. We get to do this. Right? Let's do that. Right? L listen, I, I posted a, a meme on, on, on the, you guys can't see it. It's a rev the Revolution Band has this little private little stupid strand and we joke around with each other and stuff. And there's a picture of Samuel L. Jackson in like Pulp Fiction and he's got the gun. He's like, like uh, worship leader be like, you better raise your hands. You know, I said like, we don't need to be able, to, we don't have to do that. See, the word of God, forget the authority, this is not thus saith Jessica, okay? Thus saith the Lord, 1 Timothy 2.8, God says, in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God. Can we close the issue of do I have to, do I need to, do I want to? I don't care what anyone wants. It's not about your feelings. God's word says in every place of worship, he wants holy hands lifted high. Listen, well, that, preacher, that's not praying, that's singing. What's prayer? Is prayer not a conversation with God? You talk to him, he talks to you, right? So when you're singing, that's why here, we're gonna talk a little bit about vertical worship in the weeks to come. But it, at our church, we try to endeavor every song to be sung to the Lord. Not about the Lord, but to him. The Bible tells us to, to sing praises to the Lord. So we try to sing to the Lord, that's half of the conversation. We're singing. And then Zephaniah 3.17, it says that the Lord sings over you. Yeah. So do you see the conversation? It's just a, look at, you know what, you know what worship is up here? It's, it's prayer with a melody. That's all it is. That's all it is. And so, we're, what, listen, so now, now you have a different perspective on, 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 on singing, right? Singing is a conversation with God with a melody. So when we're singing, what does it say? In every place of worship, I want men, me, women, I think that's safe to assume that, right? Men and women to pray, talking to God, listening to God, with holy hands lifted up to God. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Praise God. Number 11. 
It says that they shouted amen and amen. While lifting up their hands, they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I don't think that our church or any church is supposed to be totally crazy. But I see this and I read this text and I don't know about you, but when I read that, it's almost like you can hear your mom or your grandmother telling you how you were supposed to behave in church. And it's like, it's not that, right? It's just not that. Like, can I just offer this to you? Who cares what she said? The word of God says that this is what they did. And so I would just say this. Can I just offer you the freedom that God's word gives you not to be out of order and insane because if we're crazy in here, then people's eyes aren't here. They're watching you be crazy. And you may be worshiping well. You might be over here sobbing. And, and I, listen, I, had, I, I, was at a, I was at our church one time. There was a guy up at the altar and, and he's, like, he's getting at it with the Lord. But he was here and he was bent over and, and sorry, but his crack was hanging out so bad and everyone in their seats was just sitting there watching and laughing. And you couldn't help it. I mean, it was out there, buddy. There's a bl bl bad moon rising, or whatever that word is. It was crazy, right? <laughs> it, it was so distracting from, from what was supposed to be happening. And so he was worshiping well, but 60, 70 other people weren't worshiping at all. They were so horizontal, there was nothing here. So we have to be careful about what we do because we don't want to hinder somebody else's worship as we're worshiping well. But there's definitely freedom here to actually respond when God speaks to you through his word and he inspires you to do something, convicts you or whatever, and, and he wants you to do something. Like, go do it. Do it, right? Express your worship openly and aggressively. That's what it says. And I wanted to point this out to you. You notice the order of things here. You know, we changed a while ago what we do here. And it's not set in stone. We're not going to do it all the time about singing music last. But notice it here in the text. Did you notice it? He read the word of God. They said amen, and then they worshiped. You see, because what was happening here is they were, they, he, brought the law, he brought the word to them, and, they, and it moved them. And, it, and God wants something said, and he wants something accomplished, and he accomplished it, and then all of a sudden, you can see what happened. They fell to their faces and worshiped, and they, they hollered, they were excited, and they lifted their hands, and they fell on their face, and they worshiped the Lord. That's why we do it here. You're going to get that chance in just a minute. We're going to sing to him. And, and my only encouragement to you is that you'll do exactly, not, 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 don't do exactly what it says. Do, this is the freedom to do what he stirs up in you to do. And it's a permission slip to go do that. Okay? So be expressive in your worship. Worship followed the word. Okay, here, here's, here's the last. I'm going to combine uh, 12 and 13. 12 and 13 says that the Levites, all these men, these names, it doesn't matter what their names are, it says that they explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And then 13 says that they translated from the law of God, they translated so they could give the sense so that they understood the reading. So the first thing is, I, I want you to know that the people remained in their seat. Biblical preaching is effective if you remain in your seat and listen. Okay, okay. And I've seen it lots of times in churches, including our own. And I get done preaching my message and I walk out to the lobby and there's people sitting outside smoking cigarettes and they're having conversations in the lobby. Listen, those are awesome. They're great conversations. You want to smoke, smoke your lungs out. That's your problem. But listen, it, God has something to say to you. And the only way he's going to accomplish the task that he set out to accomplish that night is if you're in here and you remain. Listen, he preached for like four hours, right? And when they were done, when he was done, they didn't get up and, and go outside and have a smoke and talk about work. No, they didn't do that. They, it says it right there. It says that they remained in their place. Why? Because they, didn't, they weren't satisfied with just hearing it. They wanted to understand it. They want to under, what does it mean to me, Lord? That's why we take notes. So you can go home and you can study it, the context. You can meditate on what does it, not just what does it mean in studying, but meditating means what does it mean to me? 
Okay, I understand what it means now, Lord. I've looked up the word. I've, I've looked it up in the Strong's. I know what it means in Greek. I know the definition. But what does that mean to me, Lord? And you meditate on Because you want, listen, biblical preaching implies clarity. We talked about that early. Clarity. And that's why it's here. When they were done, they explained the law to people so they could have a sense of understanding what it meant. You could get up here all, listen, all day and all night and preach your, your guts out, but if, if, you, if you don't understand it, it's worthless. Uh, do me a favor and turn to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, uh, first four four verses. You know, it was really funny when I was getting ready for tonight. Even though I had like thirteen things, I literally thought this was going to go short, and I was thinking, okay, guys, tonight I'm not going to go as long as normal, but you know, here we are. Here we are. Okay, you ready? Okay, biblical preaching requires clarity and understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. When I first came to you, Paul says, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid, and trembling, and my message and my preaching, my caruso, my heralding, my proclaiming were very plain. You see? Because he wants you to understand what is being said. Nobody needs, I, if I come in here and I, and listen, you might be King James fans, right? But if I come in and I start preaching King James to you, and you don't, un, listen, it's the word of God, right? I get it. But if you don't understand any of it, what good is it going to do you? Plain language. Preacher, tell me the truth. That's all I want. That's the only thing I want of you. I don't need you to be my counselor. I don't need you to be my advocate. I don't need you to be my sponsor. I don't need you to be my coach. I just need you to tell me the truth. That's it. That's all. That's what we're supposed to do. I want you to tell me the truth. That's the greatest service I could provide. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Same book, same author, inspired by the same God. So here's Paul, right? This, don't listen if you're if you're Baptist. Don't get all freaked out at me because talk about he's talking about tongues here. Okay, you can believe what you want about tongues. I don't care what you believe about it. It's up to you. You can decide what you want. Make it at least form your opinion based on what the Bible says. Okay, but he spoke in tongues. Paul spoke in tongues, and he says right here in verse uh, 18, chapter 14. He says, "I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you." So he does it a lot, right? But, he says, but, in a church meeting, like right here, right now, he says, I would rather speak five understandable words. Do you see the clarity there? Clarity in preaching. Clarity in preaching. Offense, maybe. Hurt feelings, possibly. Clarity, definitely. Definitely. In the church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So, so that's what I was saying here. If Paul's speaking in tongues to the Lord, he's worshiping well, that's fine. But if he's doing this, and he's sitting up here talking to that, that, that angelic, whatever he's speaking, and, and you're all going, what's he saying? What good is that? Is he worshiping well? He said he was, right? But is it helping you at all? No, because biblical preaching is clear preaching. Is clear preaching. Preaching involves all of us. It's not just my job to study and speak boldly, but it's y'all's job to want God's word, to pay attention to God's word, to respond to God's word, and to humbly remain, that's a big word, remain under the authority of God's word. When we all gather every week, all of you, every week, as we are, when we are uh, 
gathering here every week and God's word is being preached, that's your responsibility. Jess, please. Sam, please. Band, please. Let me just say this as the band comes up to give you the opportunity to continue your conversation with God tonight with a melody. First song is going to be a song that um, kind of close your eyes and listen. Make the words that are sung, make, make them your words, but there'll be no lyrics on the, on the screen for you. This is just for you to listen to and let God sing to you. This is not Jessica singing to you. This is, this is the Lord singing over you. And then we're going to have a chance to, to worship him as God's word has instructed and informed us to do. Amen? But I'll just say this in closing, that it is by the gospel that God brought us together. And it is by the preaching of God's word that this family right here that's gathered each and every week will be transformed into a people that will bring beauty to the world. So I leave you with this, just a little visual. Imagine this. I think this is what it is. This is what's trying to be accomplished every week. <clears throat> we all come in, even if you've been walking with the Lord for, I don't know, 40 years. Man, I got the story today. Golly, Pastor Manny will be here next week to tell you what's going on in Mexico. But he showed me a story today on the phone, and it's a perfect illustration of what I want to share with you. I just, it just hit me just now. He said, you know, I'm at this conference in, in Palm Beach, and I'm at this hotel, and last night I took a shower at 6 o'clock, and man, I scrubbed, and I scrubbed, and I scrubbed. You know when you have a, he said, you know when you have a white shirt on? Because he had to wear a tie. He was at a fancy conference. He said, you know when you have a white shirt, and, you, and, and you, then you take it off, you always have a ring around the collar? You know what I'm talking about? He said, it's really weird because I scrubbed my neck like crazy, and then I took off my shirt that night, and I had a ring around the collar. And then I went in the shower again today, and I, and man, I just started really scrubbing it, you know? And he says, you know, it's amazing. It just hit me. The Lord was trying to teach me that no matter how long I've been showering, no matter how many times I take a shower, there's always going to be a little dirt that needs to come off. And it's the same for us. So the visual here for you is every week you come in, and not to insult you, but let's just say you just come in dirty, right? It's just, I mean, even if you're, even if, I mean, Jay, he's been a pastor for 30 years, but he's dirty. There's still things in him that are not right. There's still areas of his heart that are not yet under the lordship of Christ. There's things that are just wrong. And so every single week you come here to hear biblical preaching. And here's the visual. You come in a little bit dirty. And God's word, which is perfect and pure, it washes you. You get washed. That's what the Bible says the husband's supposed to do for his wife. To present her as a beautiful bride to the Lord, washed by his word. So every week, I want you to come in and get washed by this. Right? That's, that's us. We're gospel-centered, culture-creating community. We bring beauty to the world. We come in dirty, we get washed, and then we go. Cleaner than when you got here. You bring the beauty to the world. Amen? I love you guys so much. I hope you'll receive everything you heard tonight. And thank you for the privilege of being a pastor that gets to do just this, to preach the word. And you don't shame me. You don't shun me. You want it. And I appreciate that. I appreciate your part in biblical preaching. I really, really do. Thank you. I love you. <laughs>